Thank you. And I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, Roger Deutsch is the CEO and founder of Cell Science Systems and Privy Medica Group LLC, a nutrition telehealth consulting firm. He is also the CEO of Cell Science Systems, GmbH, Potsdam, Germany. Roger is one of the modern day pioneers of food and chemical sensitivity testing with involvement in this field since 1986. He has been responsible for the development of the ALCAT test, and he is the co-founder of Your Hidden Food Allergies Are Making You Fat, and has written numerous articles and given many lectures on this topic of food sensitivity, inflammation, and aging on all continents. Uh, once Roger is done, we have um, speaker Amy Zarka, which will be joining uh, Roger. And I'd like to introduce her now. Uh, Amy received her Bachelor of Science degree in Nutrition and Medical Dietetics from oh. Pennsylvania State University in 1983. She is also the creator and director of Privy Medica Nutrition Services. And Amy oversees the expertise of registered and licensed dietitians, nutritionists, clinical nutritionists, personal trainers, personal uh, professional chefs, and health experts committed to achieving the best possible outcome for each and every patient. Well, we are very pleased that both of you could join us today, and I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Roger, to begin your lecture. Thank you very much, Tiffany. So um, I'll just quickly introduce our company. Some people may not know. People typically refer to us as the Alcat Lab, uh, but the official name of the company is Cell Science Systems. So we are clearly a lab, and we're also an FDA device manufacturer. And what we manufacture is the instrumentation for the ALCAT test as well as the reagents. And we're the sole provider and manufacturer of uh, ALCAT testing technology. And we do provide these uh, systems for laboratories outside the United States. And Cell Science runs a no number of clinical lab tests aimed at prevention and anti-aging. They include uh, micronutrient testing, which is also a cellular response-based test where we're looking at uh, lymphoproliferation stimulated by a mitogen in the presence or absence of other nutrients. We uh, do telomere testing. We do some other uh, molecular biology for methylation cycling and, um, and a lot of gut um, health uh, investigations. We have a CECA panel. But our flagship is the ALCAT test, and we want to talk about that today, especially in the context of four separate research studies that are fairly recent that tie together and are relevant to today's environment with uh, the current pandemic. So the, the ALCAT test is a whole blood test. Oh, <clears throat> let me start at the beginning. This is what we want to cover. We want to understand the um, <clears throat> soon to be published um, research from Georgetown University in collaboration with University of Leipzig, looking at the ALCAT as a new test for non-IGE mediated food allergy, which we also refer to as food sensitivity will explain how the innate immune system is involved in delay type food reactions and how it's really the specific branch of the immune system that's involved in classical allergy because there's quite a difference. The ALCAT test is not a test for classical allergy, it's for delay type allergies. We'll look at how the ALCAT test predicts items, <clears throat> dietary items and environmental items that activate innate immunity that can lead to a number of different pathologies, including autoimmunity. <clears throat> we'll um, look at how the innate immune system activation through food triggers as determined by ALCAT can be involved in adverse um, COVID outcomes and whether or not we might be able to use this technology to predict people who will have a uh, negative uh, reaction to a vaccination, be it a COVID vaccination or otherwise. And lastly, um, Amy will join us uh, afterwards and explain how the test results are interpreted and how you can integrate this into your practice. So the key here to understand is that the immune system needs to be in balance. Uh, I was very happy to see this years ago I had a subscription to science and on this front cover in January of 13 is a lymphocyte with a yin yang sign superimposed on it. And of course, um, if you're not <clears throat> completely familiar with that Taoist concept, all of nature 
is um, <clears throat> basically expressed through the interaction and permutations and alterations and alternations of the two basic principles. One is more aggressive and masculine and hot, and the other, which is yang and the yin, is more nurturing, feminine, and, and cold. Now, the immune system we typically think of as being that which causes inflammation, which of course it does. But the other part of the system is aimed at resolving inflammation and nurturing and bringing um, immune balance and tissue restoration um, back after there's been an inflammatory response. And they're both very important if we don't have, uh, if we don't mount a strong enough uh, response to a threat or a pathogen or a danger molecule or a, a toxin, um, then it can overcome us. If we overexpress those yin, yang qualities, then we can have chronic inflammatory processes, <clears throat> excuse me, that lead to uh, tissue degradation, aging, and autoimmunity and um, can progress towards cancer. The ALCAT test, which again is our flagship test, test, is a whole blood cellular test. It's not a serological test. It is not an antibody. Um, we're looking for a biological response of the peripheral blood leukocytes, ex vivo, of the, while the cells are still alive, um, to a challenge with foods and various other substances, which in our menu will include medicinal herbs, molds, certain pharmaceuticals and other substances. What's unique about the ALCAT test, and I think this um, is truly unique, is that the results do correlate with actually eating the food um, as determined under experimental conditions by correlating with what is the gold standard, a double-blinded, placebo-controlled, oral challenge, not just whether by changing diet, the patient feels better. They probably do. There can be by elimination of common reacting foods, a lot of improvement. There can be a bit of a placebo effect, but the only way to really assess a food sensitivity test is to compare it against the known standard. And the known standard is eating the food but it should be done under rigorous conditions, double blind, so conditioning is not a factor, so we can control for the placebo effect. And these studies have been carried out on the ALCAT test over the years in different institutions and universities. We're always very liberal, even from the very beginning of our, um, when, we, when we launched this test back in the, the mid to late 80s, we gave it to university investigators who at that time were really aware that food sensitivity was a major factor in pathology and we're searching for a, food, uh, a test. We gave it to them, we let them study it. And the results came back that there is a very, very high correlation between what we see in the test well in terms of how the blood cells respond to a challenge and what happens when the person eats the food or is exposed to the uh, food additive under these conditions. Naturally that improves a number of different different inflammatory conditions, uh, notably migraine, notably GI health, notably uh, arthritis and other um, autoimmune diseases, uh, CNS conditions and so forth. It also, as we'll see, and this is kind of the central theme of some of the recent studies, is that it also identifies foods that are associated with the release of DNA into the circulation and a process of uh, neutrophil or white blood cell, granulocytic blood cell uh, response to pathogens or danger signals called netosis. And I'm going to focus on that a little bit because that's kind of the interesting theme, I think, that runs through some of the recent research. And just briefly, and this will <clears throat> just mention, but can be referred to later on, is a meta analysis of these studies looking at specific outcomes. So what happens when the innate immune system is activated? And by innate immune system, we're talking about the front line, natural immunity, 
which doesn't require prior sensitization like the specific immune system. Um, be it a danger um, signal or a PAMP, um, a, a pathogenic um, molecular pattern or a damp, a danger associated molecular pattern. Sometimes innate immune cells get activated. Um, they cause the release of toxic mediators that are stored in granules from within and also generate free radicals, which can spew out along with contents that are inside the cell, including the formation of neutrophil extracellular traps, which we'll explain, which contain uh, nuclear components, DNA, histones, uh, toxic mediators, uh, membrane components. And when these go out, they are intended to, um, <clears throat> just gonna jump ahead for a second. They're intended to trap pathogens. This is an activated neutrophil, which has gone into the process of natosis. And you can see, again, it stands for neutrophil extracellular traps. This particular photograph sort of set off the interest in research in the field of netosis in this particular pathway that the innate immune system uses. In this case, obviously to entrap, ensnare, and apply to the pathogen toxic components, which include DNA and modified histones, as well as things like myeloperoxidase and elastase, which hopefully will kill the, the pathogen. So after jumping ahead there, I wanna come back and fill in the, the gap. How does this work? What we do with this test is, it, as I mentioned, it's a whole blood test. So we take the whole blood into the laboratory, we get it overnight, and we dilute it in a buffered saline and then pipette it or dispense it into a well that contains either a test reagent, a, could be a food or a chemical, a food additive, for example. And then also some wells serve as controls. And this then goes through an analyzer, which will count in size the blood particles in that al aliquot. Um, we're looking at the white blood cells. So just before analysis, we have a method for eliminating the red blood cells so they do not interfere. And from this, we generate a histogram for each sample. So the control samples uh, are average and they form a baseline. If you can see it on your screen, that would be depicted by this histogram in the broken line. And then the test histogram for each individual substance is then plotted against the control. And any divergence can be seen. So in this case, we see that the test curve is lower than the baseline um, curve. And that's because cells have degranulated and they have essentially disappeared. And they may be in the process of undergoing natosis, but certainly the membrane has broken down and they are releasing chemicals and free radicals into the surrounding tissue. And that's what it would look like. Sometimes the cells don't fully degranulate. They do swell up. Uh, they attempt perhaps to phagocytize a threatening pathogen and they swell up and we see the test curve shifting to a higher size range to the right. And of course, if there's no reaction, which we hope to see, um, that's not true. We hope to find a, a reactions because those are the things we need to focus on. But when there's no reaction, the curves line up um, together and that's what it would look like under the microscope. Um, this graphic illustrates what's happening in the machine where the rubber hits the road. The cells are passing through a sensing zone which um, where there's an electromagnetic field created by a cathode and an anode. And they're suspended now in a buffer and electrolytic pollution. Uh, and these are their cells and they're exposed to a test substance and they change in size. And that change in size is sensed um, by our circuitry. And from that, we're able to generate the size distribution curve that I mentioned. Um, again, for the controls, which would look like this. And then for each individual test curve. 
This would be an example of a positive reaction. There's a shift to the right, some swells have gotten lar larger, and many of them have degranulated and released their uh, inner contents. Clinically, and this is the first of the four studies that I'd like to introduce, um, we were approached by people at Yale School of Medicine a few years ago who had uh, performed an NIH-funded study um, surveying the market concerning use of non-conventional medical tests. And this group found out that there was a great preference for looking at food sensitivities using this cellular approach, specifically the ALCAT test. And because one of the um, um, principal investigators was a gastroenterologist at, at Yale, he wanted to look at irritable, irritable bowel syndrome. And the study that they designed was a double-blinded, placebo-controlled, randomized controlled trial uh, involving 59 subjects, basically at a, taking baseline measurements of symptoms and looking at the outcomes over four weeks and eight weeks. And those outcomes are depicted here. This is IBS symptoms, global improvement score, and symptom severity score. And this is the treatment group. These are the people who had the ALCAT test diet and after four weeks, this is the change in symptoms, very pronounced. Now, the placebo group um, also had, um, particularly after four weeks, but then it died down, a, a, a benefit. And um, of course, there's a strong benefit of placebo in, in IBS. But essentially, the difference here was essentially twofold. So the p-value is kind of off the charts that this had to be something that was uh, Due to the um, due to the the treatment and not a placebo, so they found that there was no evidence of um, the placebo effect um, or, or or the study not having validity because of the way in which the foods were eliminated. Sometimes these kinds of studies are not so well designed because it's very important when you give a placebo diet which foods you're taking out. So sometimes when someone wants to stimulate a good result, they take out dairy and, 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 and grains, and just that alone randomly produces some effect. In this case, they decided to test everybody with the ALCAT and maintain the rigor and complexity of the control diet um, with that of the therapeutic diet. And the way they did that uh, was this, if they found that a person tested positive to one meat, two vegetables, uh, one nut and one dairy, they would remove that. Um, again, it was double blinded. They removed that from the controlled diet, but not the same two meats, one dairy, one nut, one vegetable, but a different one. So that the rigor and complexity of, of the therapeutic diet and the con controlled diet were identical. Then they decided they, uh, at the outset of the study, they banked serum from everyone and then retrospectively, looked at uh, changes in serum using a proteinomic screen and found that particularly amongst those, and it was about 12 out of the, out, out of the group that had the uh, therapeutic diet who had a, the stronger responses, they looked at what changed chemically in their blood. And um, there were many uh, things that exceeded a 0.05 change. A lot of inflammatory markers reduced, but particularly was neutrophilolastase that of course uh, is known to be uh, damaging to tissues. Of course, it's aimed at neutralizing pathogens, but it has side effects. And it also will degrade muscle tissue. So that was, was worth noting. This group had also previously worked um, studying the role of DNA as a danger associated molecular pattern in a number of disease states, um, some of which involved the hypocytokines that have been discussed today tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin beta. And um, these things are also been shown to be uh, relevant to autoimmune diseases as represented by lupus and uh, um, ischemic reperfusion injury and uh, NASH, uh, fatty liver. So this led the same team to want to investigate a little bit more deeply because as you see, with the ALCAT test, we're measuring gross changes in the cell's population. But the question they pose, being the researchers that they are, is what's actually happening inside? 
And uh, they published their findings, um, uh, which were showing three basic things that I think are notable. But the one I wanna focus on right now is of course, that following a positive um, food challenge, positive by ALCAT test, they determined that there was a greater amount of cell-free DNA in the supernatant of that reaction than there was in a negative um, ALCAT uh, result and um, or control. So a positive ALCAT reaction would via, and this is another thing they studied, activate this kinase, protein kinase C, which would lead to the result of the release of DNA either from the mitochondria or from the nuclear. Now that's something to keep in mind because they can be different. They can have different effects. Uh, negative response did not do that. And when they used inhibitor, inhibitors for kinases, they found that using the inhibitor for protein kinase C would inhibit these reactions, leading them to conclude protein kinase C is um, at least a major pathway here as well as nuclear factor kappa B. And I mention that because um, <clears throat> when we do intermittent fasting, we're down-regulating another protein kinase A, which is related. So it's no surprise that we're dampening down inflammation and bringing about physiological changes that we see that are consistent with um, healthier metabolism. So, I wanna focus in now a bit about the NETS. So they've been associated with the following broad categories of conditions, autoimmunity, cardio, cancer metastases, um, COVID fatality, uh, fatty liver, pancreatitis. And if you look now um, at PubMed, this is a, the result of a search that I did uh, a little over a week ago. And these are literally verbatim, the search terms that I used. So nets, again, neutrophil extracellular traps and inflammation were 1,030 results. COVID-19 complications, 33. COVID-19 fatality, eight results. Thrombosis, 32. Autoimmunity, 408. Cardiovascular disease, 579. Cancer, three over 3,000. Aging. 169 dementia, 54 results and continues. Respiratory disease, uh, 529. Um, um, treatment uh, of nets using enzymes that degrade DNA are, are used right now for some respiratory diseases successfully. So it's beginning to go into the, um, into the clinic. Pneumonia, 192 results. Probably there's some overlap here. Uh, organ failure, I'm sure there's some overlap with COVID. Um, 47 results, obesity, uh, 53, eye disease, liver disease, cystic fibrosis, and cystic fibrosis is being treated right now with, um, again, DNases. So I just want to uh, um, cover quickly some of the, in the interest of time here, the, the high points, we find that um, when there's um, uh, cell-free DNA, this can activate certain receptors on, on macrophages, cause the upregulation of inflammatory cytokines and the interferons are associated with autoimmunity. And um, this has been clearly demonstrated in lupus and arthritis particularly, but a number of other uh, um, autoimmune diseases. Um, the leukocyte activation test, when it was positive, gave a higher level of DNA content in the supernatin activated by protein kinase C. Um, there was also upregulation of um, inflammatory marker on the cell surface of eosinophils most of the time, which is another granulocyte um, subpopulation that is associated with allergy, um, getting a lot more attention right now than it has over previous years. And uh, the conclusion is, is that um, this test is able to identify foods which cause the release of DNA and activation of peripheral blood immune cells in a PKC dependent manner. 
and it suggests that these uh, inflammatory markers will activate symptoms that can range from IBS to um, other conditions. IBS is just a functional disorder, but it's not very comfortable. Um, this gave rise to an investigation which is just going into print next month. And I'll give you a bit of background. Um, some of you may know Professor Joe Belanti from Georgetown because he's lectured at the A4M on a, a few occasions at the fellowships on immunology. He's been uh, working with uh, immunology. Uh, he's a professor of immunology and microbiology at, at Georgetown. And um, his group had found that um, certain DNA motifs that were not methylated were more inflammatory than were those that were methylated. And essentially the distinction is that is this, when you have nuclear DNA, which of course is the bulk of that, for the most part it's methylated because um, uh, differentiated cells don't need so many genes. Um, so they're mostly switched off. And when they're released, they are not as inflammatory as are uh, fragments of DNA that originate from the mitochondria. And most likely because mitochondrion genes being much fewer in number, 47, um, they are for the most part not methylated, certainly not in the same sites as the uh, nuclear DNA is. And they resemble much more closely um, bacterial DNA. So it's not surprising that they would in, in turn be more pro-inflammatory. So what Belanti's group wanted to do in collaboration with our company uh, in Germany and people at University of Leipzig was to distinguish whether or not the DNA that was released into the supernatant following an ALCAD positive food challenge was of mitochondrial or nuclear origin. And you do this by using primers and probes that are specific to their nuclear DNA, uh, uh, nuclear DNA motifs or specific to mitochondrial DNA motifs. So essentially this is the concept is to try and determine whether or not the DNA that was released was from either or both of these sources. Uh, and of course we use the Coulter method that we talked about which has these advantages. It's simpler. It's a very direct, it doesn't, it doesn't require a label like a serological test or certain others, cellular test. It's just, there's the cells in the whole blood diluted in a physiological solution. And there's a challenge. And do the cells change their size and number or do they not? And um, so it's a very direct and uh, method that represents a final common pathway. And one thing they note is that although there's a number of different factors, uh, danger molecules, so to speak, that can activate the cells in this way, they can also be pharmacologically induced. So we're looking at an innate immune cell reaction, which causes this sequelae, chronic inflammatory conditions that can lead to autoimmunity and so forth. But it can be induced by a pharmacological, uh, pharmacological factor. Meaning, for example, you, you have uh, in every food, every plant, every fruit, every vegetable, natural toxins uh, that protect them from, from plants. And if it's been part of our genetic heritage, we've evolved the enzymes to degrade those toxins. If it's something new and in modern times, it often is, we may not be able to fully detoxify these naturally occurring chemicals or even chemicals that have been added to the food and they can induce an innate immune cell reaction and all the sequelae um, without raising antibodies. It's a pharmacological reaction. These chemicals are actually too small to raise antibodies. So the concept here is that the ALCAT test is looking at a final common pathway. And I'm convinced that's the reason why it correlates as well as it does with actually eating the food. So the conclusion they came to was that the induction of nets containing pro-inflammatory mitochondrial DNA might provide the clinical link necessary for a better understanding of the pathogenesis of non-IgE mediated food allergy. 
which again is typically a delayed reaction or more difficult to diagnose because it is delayed and symptoms are not as acute. That's a topic for another lecture, but of course we know that type one or classical allergy to a food, be it a crustacean, for example, uh, where someone uh, eats a crustacean, gets hives right away, or has even a small amount of, of um, uh, the protein in peanuts, um, it can produce a very dramatic effect even in an anaphylactic reaction. That's not what we're looking at right now. We're looking at these more delayed, uh, nuanced, subtle, chronic inflammatory conditions, which are a little bit difficult to tease apart. There are, as we mentioned, there's a number of studies coming out, it's increasing each year, um, talking about neutrophil exercise traps, and that's and this was of interest to me because it summed up a couple of points that I think relate to today's topic. So the dark side of neutrophils, neutrophil extracellular traps. Uh, these folks are from Sweden and Copenhagen from government uh, laboratories. So nets contain antigens, some of which are modified histones. Now histones are, you know, the DNA in the nucleus is not just floating around, it's wrapped around these octomer proteins called histones. And these um, protein structures uh, have a positive charge and DNA is negatively charged. So it keeps it tightly round, uh, wound around there so that not all the genes are expressed, only, only when there's a modification to the histone there's, is there a change in electrical charge and that DNA can then be accessed. But when this netosis process occurs, there's a decondensation of the chromatin meaning the DNA and the histones. And then there's a merger of these contents with these mediators like elastase and myeloperoxidase and, and other uh, chemicals and the membrane proteins forming these nets. And that's been shown to be uh, um, induced formation of autoantibodies because the histones and the DNA that are toxic will remodel the tissue of the target tissue and then the immune system doesn't recognize it and produces antibodies. So this is a clear pathway to autoimmunity, which doesn't actually involve um, the specific uh, immune system directly. Uh, so it can be acquired, uh, but yet it looks like it's a genetic um, uh, autoimmune condition. For example, uh, although I don't have the slide here regrettably, Recently from Stanford, there's a group looking at um, the increase in diabetes. And they found that the group that does not have the genetic predisposition for developing type one diabetes uh, are showing the greatest increase in the incidence of diabetes. So there's some other pathway besides the specific immune system. Although, the two work hand in hand, it's very nuanced, um, but essentially the nets and the neoantigens that are created when tissue is modified by these toxic histones can create autoantibodies. Um, the, the nets were discovered as extracellular strands of decondensed DNA and complex with histone and granule proteins expelled from dying cells to ensnare and kill microbes but they may spur autoantibodies and serve as scaffolds for thrombosis, providing a link uh, amongst infection, autoimmunity, and thrombosis. So in this graphic, this is what the histones essentially look like. The DNA is wrapped around there. Um, there's an enzyme, uh, peptidyl arginine, arginine deaminase, which will change the uh, histone uh, charge, it will citrullinate uh, the tail of the histone. It becomes a negative charge, it decomposes, and then we get um, then the possibility for the decondensation of the nuclear material. And when that happens, as we see here, we have a neutrophil forming a net. It can go down and uh, hit different tissue. Uh, arthritis, we have anti-nuclear cytostolic antibodies being created against citrullinated histones and causing arthritis, causing um, myeloperoxidase, causing um, vasculitis. 
And I think of interest today with what we're facing in the pandemic and blood clotting induced by innate immune cell activation is this pathway of neutrophils, and, which again, induce sexual innate histones causing um, uh, and DNA in the last days, uh, which is a major factor that ALCAT identifies the cause of, for, uh, forms a scaffold for activated platelets and we get thrombosis. And I think this is a key factor in terms of what we're looking at right now. There's a number of papers, this is just one, showing that COVID inflammatory microvascular thrombi are present in the lung, kidney, and heart of the COVID fatalities. And they contain extracellular traps associated with platelets and, and fibrin. Um, one of the other things, this is a recently published paper in British Journal of Gastroenterology having to do with it. Again, uh, a totally separate outcat um, investigation from the University of Texas, uh, looking at metabolic health, obesity. And this was a longitudinal case control study looking over the course of one year, putting people into one of four different groups, either an ALCAT avoidance diet together with aerobic surge exercising, uh, ALCAT diet alone, exercise alone, and neither. And looking at outcomes in terms of waist measurement, BMI and scale weight. And um, a good drop amongst those people who were doing exercise in both weight, BMI, and waist circumference. Um, but even the group that didn't do any exercise, um, but just avoided uh, their trigger foods, experienced nearly the same benefit. Although I would never advocate for just changing diet. I think exercise, and I'm sure everybody would agree, in the right um, proportion for each person uh, is about the healthiest thing you can do. Um, but if you had to choose food allergy, which you don't, you can do both. Food allergy elimination um, produces a more profound effect than exercise alone. I wanted to just bring this up a little bit because we've been talking about the innate immune cells. cells. And this is actually an immune cell, a certain kind of dendritic cell um, that talks to a T cell. And these are specific cells. Now, they're called specific because T cells and B cells are specific to the pathogen. Um, so not all T cells get activated when there's a certain pathogen. Um, they interact, uh, uh, the process begins when a pathogen or an inciting danger molecule or an allergen is taken up by an antigen presenting cell, uh, migrates to lysosomes where its peptides are broken down, where it binds with an MHC uh, molecule, major histocompatibility molecule complex. So you have peptides with this MHC molecule. Now these are genetically determined, which is why certain people can eat gluten, certain people cannot, and the people who cannot, it's because of this molecule right here. It's the genes that encode for this mo molecule that enabled it to bind with the gluten peptides and then transport it to the cell surface where it can activate a T cell which uh, recognizes those peptides in that molecule. If you don't have that molecule, you can't get celiac disease. That's why the genetic uh, tests for celiac have such great negative predictability. And that's another group of tests that we do, genetic tests for celiac and colon disease and serological tests to see if there's active um, disease process going on. When the T cell gets uh, activated, it then divides. Because this, again, may be a memory cell, maybe a naive T cell that now comes to recognize this, or one that saw this before and is now remembering it. And then it multiplies. And the extent to which it multiplies is the extent to which it can directly fight infected cells or signal over to B cells that share the same kind of receptors to produce soluble forms of those susceptible receptors we call antibodies that correspond with the inciting pathogen or allergen. Uh, and depending upon which uh, interleukin it is will determine the isotype of the antibody, which is very important because right now we know um, it's the IgG and IgM antibodies that show we have exposure. So they're good tests for determining whether we've had exposure say to um, COVID. 
Now IgE, which is much less frequent, it's about one ten thousandth as frequent as an IgG antibody, will be the reagenic antibody, which leads to an allergy reaction. So that's a more complex system, it's more sophisticated, but they work hand in hand. And what's interesting is that amongst all the other diabolical things that nets can do directly, they also prime T cells. So making their threshold for activation um, uh, at a much lower level. So again, this can aggravate the, um, the um, <clears throat> gang side that we really don't want to happen. So I guess at this point, you're getting the sense that our concept is amongst everything else you do, all the supplements you take, all the programs you do, all the stress management, you have to have a diet that's right for you, otherwise you're swimming upstream. And just to take it a little bit further, I want to mention, because as we saw before, that the innate, um, sorry, the specific immune system is responsible for producing specific antibodies to fight something if the innate immune system has not um, <clears throat> achieved um, um, resolution of that attack, the um, specific immune system, antibody um, uh, affinity maturation will become uh, more and more um, precise upon repeated exposure. Again, that's the concept underlying vaccination. You're exposed to something, the spike protein, whether it comes directly or we're induced to manufacture it, the specific immune system gets familiar with it, recognizes it more readily on re-exposure and consistent re-exposure continues to modify the antibody to be more and more uh, precisely uh, uh, have greater affinity with that. The innate immune cells also undergo changes, but not in their genes, but in their epigenetics. And this is a very cool paper that appeared in New England Journal um, showing how in order again to maintain balance, the innate immune cells undergo epigenetic modifications, not genetic rearrangements like the B cells to produce antibodies, but changes on the uh, epigenetic level. And therefore it's really the epigenetic signature of the person that determines how they, uh, how they respond to future exposures. And one of the other interesting things is that the Western diet has been shown to cause epigenetic changes that train the innate immune system such that a secondary stimulus, uh, in other words, the system is primed now, the secondary stimulus can produce a much more yang type response and go overboard and potentially it would be uh, pathogenic. So watch out for that, which we all know, Western diet triggers um, uh, NLRP3 dependent innate immune reprogramming. So all those other factors on the previous page from the recent New England Journal, we're talking about pathogens reprogramming the immune system. Now we're talking about how Western diet reprograms the immune system in a way which we don't want. And just in conclusion, I want to bring out one further concept that nets are associated with. So once we have the activation of these cells and they die, we have to clean them up. Now, of course, there's, a, there's actually give or take 100 billion cells that naturally die every day and they have to be removed. And the macrophages in the system, the monocytes in the blood and the macrophages in the tissue will remove those and do so silently. In fact, when it removes cells that die of apoptosis without having been um, activated, they actually reprogram the macrophages towards an anti-inflammatory or resolution type phenotype, or an M2 phenotype, which is the yin side of the immune system. And it causes upregulation of things like um, interleukin 10, which are anti-inflammatory. However, if the uh, macrophages have to clean up a lot of this cellular debris from activated cells, again, we saw the pathways, these DNA 
molecules that are circulating will activate through toll-like receptors, macrophages, and make them pro-inflammatory. But the whole gestalt of this dead cell and all this paraphernalia that's with it will program the macrophages towards a pro-inflammatory stance, which will protect, uh, perpetuate this. And it's done through uh, certain cell surface molecules that um, are uh, generated on the surface of the macrophages. And they respond to, and believing this is a technical term, it's not meant to be cute, uh, find me signals and eat me signals that are expressed on these dead and dying cells. And um, what happens is that nets, diabolical as they are, I mean, they're good when you need it, but um, undue activation of the innate immune system on a chronic basis will cause all these issues. And the last thing they do is if insult it wasn't enough, they have to then inhibit the ability of the cells to clear away this junk. So here we have a neutrophile going into netosis. Here's the macrophage, which would be quite a bit bigger, which is trying to digest this and neutralize it. There's a molecule which is particularly involved. There's, this again is one of these eat me signals that's mediated by uh, a, pa um, a molecule MFGEA, which stands for milk. Um, um, God, what does it stand for? Uh, milk something uh, epithelial factor eight. It comes from milk. And it helps the macrophage um, through integrins on its surface uh, bind to the, the apoptotic cell with um, the mediation of this op opsonin, which binds to the apoptotic cell but the nets will inhibit that. So all the way around, you can get a vicious cycle where the inflammation produces more inflammation and becomes chronic. And I think this is a foundation that is important for everything that we're looking at, all the kinds of diseases ranging from IBS up to cardiovascular diseases, metabolic disorders, which are all interlinked, and even the, the complications from the more, um, severe COVID fatalities or reactions, including the fatalities. Thank you for that. I'm gonna turn this over to Amy who will explain what you practically do with this information. Hi everybody, it's great to be here. Uh, uh, thank you everyone for uh, uh, asking us to be here. And in the interest of time, I am just going to skip my slides and uh, I think you all have a uh, copy, uh, a PDF of all of our slides. So you'll see that this, uh, so we were just, the last part of this presentation is just to present a case of a patient who experienced great benefit from the ALCAT test and, and identifying her reactive foods. And, and at the same time, giving an idea of how to break down the test results and how we suggest they get explained to patients and point out some important things about that. But basically this, this patient who we'll call Cheryl, she was struggling with weight. She had GI issues. Um, she had inflammation. She shared some conventional blood work with us. Her estimated average glucose was elevated. Her, um, her, um, her A1C was elevated uh, above the optimal and her C-reactive protein was also, also elevated. She had symptoms of constipation and gas and bloating, but her big issue really was to, uh, the reason for coming to see us was to lose weight and to uh, reduce inflammation. So uh, it was because, thing, you know, she really was not an unhealthy eater, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and uh, when she came to see us, she was following intermittent fasting. Uh, she was avoiding dairy already. Um, she was eating plenty of fruits and vegetables and uh, taking protein powder shakes, but good products. Daily, she was following a personal trainer's suggestions for a few months. So, uh, uh, so she actually was was you know what you would consider a, a person following a, a health promoting eating pattern, but things were still not working for her. So, uh, it was decided to uh, for her to have the ALCAT test done to identify what food culprits could be working against her weight loss efforts and contributing to inflammation and her GI symptoms. So these are actually her results. So she was tested back in June of last year. And um, the, the thing that we, one thing that we feel, let me show you the whole page here. This is the front first page, 250 foods here on this first page, 250 foods reported here. Uh, <clears throat> 
As Roger describes, this VALCAT test is not a test for the IgE-mediated food allergy. So I think it's very important that we uh, differentiate with patients the different adverse reactions to foods because it's confusing to patients. So, and even before they get tested with the ALCAD test, it's important, I think, for you to let them know that this is not an allergy test. So if your patient has a, an allergy to like say shellfish, doesn't matter what the ALCAD test says about shellfish, they need to avoid shellfish. This is not a test for the type of the IgE mediated um, food allergies. Cheryl did not have any food allergies, by the way, although she had an allergy to hair dye. Uh, then uh, there are intolerances and uh, we're trained to think of intolerances, of course, as the, the lack or the insufficient availability of a particular enzyme that is necessary to digest a particular component in food. So we're all familiar with the lactose intolerance, the fructose intolerance, FODMAP. And many, many people are coming to us, you know, interested in having the ALCAT test done because they're following these type or avoiding these things and following FODMAP and they're not seeing the results that they expect to see. So it's important to explain the different adverse reactions and to say, this is not a blanket diet here. This is what your cells are reacting to. As, as, as Roger said, the inflammatory response is happening from the leukocytes. So um, this, again, her, her test results, I think it's important always to focus on the good news. So we you know, took her right away to the green box here and, and got an idea of what she enjoyed from the green box. I think that's, you know, important to share the good news first. The degree of reactivity in the ALCAT test is, um, is designated with the color coding system here. So again, green is non-reactive. And then the severe would be in red, moderate in orange, and mild in yellow. The general recommendations would be to eliminate the severe reactions for six months or more, the moderate reactions for three months or more, and the mild list, we would, the general recommendation would be to limit them to one day every four days or two days in every eight. Now I say general because obviously it's important to individualize for our patients. So we do recommend going through this with your patient in detail or allow us to do that with you um, or, or with your patient. But um, what we did with Cheryl and what I could tell you was significant for her in the severe list, um, believe it or not, she was not consuming apples, but beef a couple of days a week, shallots. I was very surprised that that was, uh, she was having a lot of shallots. So she just loved shallots. So she was using that a lot in her recipes and the protein powder that she was having daily had sunflower in it. So, you know, I, if you, if you share these results with your patient and you find out that severe list you, know, you go through them and the patient says, yeah, I really don't eat those things. So you figure, okay, they're already avoiding those and they're still symptomatic. So it might make you want to tighten up the rules a little bit with the mild list. So this is why it's important to individualize. The moderate list, what was significant for Cheryl was anchovy. She was having Caesar dressing a couple of days a week. Uh, often when I see anchovy or sardine or both, I think of fish oil. So it's important to, uh, to be aware of that. It's not just about the food. It's about supplements. It's about personal care products. And uh, it, Cheryl was not consuming fish oil. But as you know, anchovy and sardine are very common fish oil sources in the good fish oil products. But uh, so just to make you aware of that, that, that jumps out at me. Avocado, she was having guacamole. Uh, she was um, consuming eggs a few days a week. She was having rice daily in her protein powder. Walnuts she was having and potatoes. So those were the most significant ones. And what I wanna point out here is a lot of times patients will say, well, I thought, you know, I thought salmon was, you know, one of the, the healthiest fish to consume. I thought walnuts were, were anti-inflammatory. Broccoli, I thought it was good for me. And the point is, yes, they are in and of themselves health promoting foods. They are considered anti-inflammatory, but not for her right now. They are actually pro-inflammatory. As Roger showed you, the graphic of the cells changing in the number and the size, releasing those mediators, inflammatory substances into the circulation. So I, you know, when you put it in perspective like that for a patient, they realize, oh, okay, no wonder I've got inflammation. Uh, so the other thing that um, very often happens, you'll hear from patients, they might look at their severe list and say, oh, come on, beef, really? I eat beef all the time and I don't have a problem with beef. And my response is, 
Well, yeah, you do. You know, that's the point. You know, you're looking for symptoms that would happen immediately after ingesting the offender, like would happen in type one IgA mediated allergies minutes after ingesting the offender. That's not how it is with the food sensitivity response. The, sen- the symptoms are more response that, that they'll experience with food sensitivities tend to be more chronic and more vague. So when you put it in perspective like that to a patient, they say, all right, you know, even though they might not feel that inflammatory response, inflammation is happening, whether they realize it or not. Then at the bottom of the page on the, in the ALCAT test, they're looking at candida, albicans, gluten, gliadin, casein in the way. The reason why these um, test components get their own box is because when they're reactive, it would uh, require the elimination of more than one food. So they get their own boxes. So we all know what candida albicans is, the yeasty-like fungus. Um, uh, When reactive in the ALCAT test, it's not a diagnosis for, um, for candida overgrowth, but it does make us suspect that the patient has it. So we need to take steps to avoid the sugar. We would recommend antimicrobials, but we only recommend things that were tested and non-reactive. So you might want to suggest caprylic acid, which is coming from coconut. We can't suggest that because she was reactive to it. You might want to suggest garlic. Well, garlic was a mild reaction. Um, well, you can't suggest that very much. We could suggest oil of oregano. If, if a person is tested for golden seal with berberine, you know, we can suggest that if non-reactive. So my point is only utilize things that were tested and non-reactive. Gluten, gliadin. She didn't react to gluten, but she reacted mildly to gliadin. So this was significant for Cheryl. She needed to be sugar free. She needed to be gluten free. She was already dairy free. Um, because I thought her symptoms and her her results were pretty significant with the you know the, with being meaning she was consuming these prior to the test. I knew this was going to make a difference for her. We kept the mild list in two days per week. So ultimately. Um, you know, you're following the 5R program. We all know 5R, you know, remove. The, the ALCAT test is telling us what to remove. The ALCAT test is telling us what foods to replace. We replace digestive enzymes if need be. We inoculate. We suggested Saccharomyces boulardii for Cheryl. Uh, and repairing the gut, the gut healing nutrients, of course. So the goal is that your patient, after following these, Uh, results following your 5R program. They've given the immune system a rest from the reactive foods. They've healed the gut. And you want to hear the patient say, oh my gosh, I feel wonderful. I feel for all the reasons that that what prompted the test, everything is being resolved or it is, it's already resolved. I feel wonderful. My weight is responding. My digestion is good, which is exactly what happened to Cheryl. You can see in her slides, six months later, body fat percentage came down. Her C-reactive protein came down. She's no longer constipated. She's sleeping an average of seven hours a night, no longer uh, has gas and bloating. That's what you want to hear the patient say. Then you'd be ready to reintroduce these previously reactive foods systematically one at a time uh, to see if the symptoms return because these are not necessarily forever. And that's another kind of uh, confusing uh, question that patients have it. Don't, don't I need to avoid this for the rest of my life? No, your immune system is changing like every system in the human body. So what you're reactive to could change. And the goal would be that she's no longer reactive to all these things. We've healed the gut and we have um, encouraged a variety of foods. So she'd be able to tolerate these things again. Uh, the last slide you'll see in your slide in, in the in the handout is about Prevy Medica. We are the sister company to Cell Science Systems. We've been around for almost 10 years doing virtual nutrition therapy to people all over the country. Uh, how we help cell science systems practitioners is we give complimentary review of all the test results that cell science systems, all the tests that cell science systems offers. You could always have a, a review with either myself or someone on my team. I have a wonderful team of nutritionists uh, or your patient can do that. We customize meal planning tools. Uh, you could participate in that service. We, we could make meal planning tools, which is exactly what we did for Cheryl. Uh, and we looked up special products that might that would work with her results. We do that sort of thing as well. We would provide the booklet for you with your practice logo on it, 
to share with your patient. And we also, um, if you don't have a nutritionist on your team, we're happy to be the nutritionist for you. Um, from where we are in Deerfield Beach, Florida, and I also have nutritionists on uh, on my network in other in other states too. So that's just a little bit about running through the Alcat test results. I'm sorry, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we had some time so that you could see what the re test results look look like. This is just the food page. There are many other uh, test agents that the Alcat test tests for. So um, Tiffany, that's, that's, that does it for, for my part of the presentation. I think we're over time. Great, thank you so much, Amy, and thank you, Roger. Um, we appreciate Cell Science sponsoring this lecture.